VR experiences using higher dimensions of sound. Exciting, right? Dude. Prepare to expand your mind. So here's an outline of what's going to be covered today. I'm going to start with expanding your dimensional awareness, which is covering the concept of 3D, 4D, and 5D in about eight minutes, which is no small challenge, but I think it works. Then a brief touch on how we hear and process sound. Uh, obviously, that would be much more than a 60-minute talk in and of itself, but I'm going to touch on what's important for these concepts. And then 5D audio, what it is and how to use it. So this is a little bit about me. I'm a sound designer and composer. I uh, live in Austin, been here about five years. Uh, local coffee, craft beers, tacos. Uh, spent 11 years in games. Worked at Electronic Arts, LucasArts, Raven, uh, these places. So, so what? What do I know about hacking the brain? Well, here's a little example of a VR experience I worked on. It'll show some of these techniques in action. That's the mummy prodigium strike, and she got so scared, she had to go back into the fake helicopter in the experience because she couldn't handle being out in the real world. <laughs> so we'll talk about how to make people that scared in a little bit. But for now, expanding your dimensional awareness. So what is the fifth dimension? For anyone that doesn't know, uh, it's not these equations on this board. Well, it kind of is, but uh, we're not going to go there. Don't panic. We're going to explain it real quickly. So, is 5D Auto a BuzzFeed clickbait headline? Well, sort of, because you're here, but <laughs> most of it is what we experience every moment of our existence. We actually exist in a snapshot of the fifth dimension at all times. That's a little mind-blowing if you're not familiar with the concept, but our concept of now is merely a momentary snapshot of awareness in a 5D probability space in a moment of 4D time located in 3D space. What the f*** is going on? You might think, wait a minute, Aaron, I thought you said this wasn't going to get complex. Uh, so we're going to break it down and make it really simple. I go why? Definition of dimension. It's a measurable extent or quantity that denotes the degree to or range over which something extends. That's the basic concept of what a dimension is. So what does that even mean, right? 1D would be length. That's just a line. 2D, you add width, and you get a plane, and anyone who's made a video game knows what a plane is. You add one more dimension, you get length, width, and height, and you get 3D, the world we see every day. So how do we expand on that? You add time. Time, right now for me, somewhere in this. At one point, I was that. I hope to be that, but I'll definitely be that. Uh, we only perceive one moment in this time. But this timeline exists independent of our perception. There will be a before and an after, we just can't see it. If we add one more thing, we get the fifth dimension, which is choice and probability. So it's kind of the things we choose to do, whether I drink from the water or I don't, as well as probability theory, which is, stands above and beyond the choice we can make. It's, things may just happen. It's not all under our control. So this is the dimension we actually exist in every day. It's one snapshot of the fifth dimension. So if that's still uh, a little kind of odd and these, these graphics aren't doing it for you, I made a little video presentation using the wonderful game Stanley Parable, which is all about this concept anyway. Choice. It's the best part of being a real person. Your instructor will guide you in an exercise to test and reinforce the material covered in this video. Stanley decided to go to the meeting room. Perhaps he had simply missed a memo. When Stanley came to a set of two open doors, he entered the door on his left.
This was not the correct way to the meeting room, and Stanley knew it perfectly well. So that's a really concise demonstration that it's really just one snapshot of our choices that we live in every day. So 2D is a slice of 3D space, 3D is a snapshot of 4D time and 40 is a slice of 5D out of all the possible probability outcomes and choices the players might make. And 5D is the slice we perceive every day. So that's the dimensions. If you've never heard of fifth dimensions, that was important to cover. How we hear. I go on. Well, how we hear is uh, you know, not too bad. It's uh, objects vibrate and push volumes of air that air pushes other volumes of air in all directions. It collapses objects in the world. This eventually reaches their head in both of our ears, which I'm not really going to read this. Uh, it's very complex. I'll put references in the end, uh, let alone going into HRTF, binaural, all these complex things of localization. Well beyond the scope of this talk, if you're in this room and you've done VR, you've probably read some things. I'll have references later for you. But what you do need to know is it is super complicated. Uh, through hundreds of millions of years of evolution, we've built these systems where we know all sorts of things about the world. We're tr constantly trying to make sense of everything around us, always spending energy doing so. So, things we need to know, our brains are constantly monitoring and making sense of our world. There's an overwhelming amount of things going on in this world, and our brain is basically just trying to condense it to what's important for survival, what's important to me, uh, how do I make sense of these things. Our brains are pattern-seeking machines. We lock into patterns in 150 milliseconds. Uh, and these, I'll show these studies later. It's pretty fascinating. I didn't even know this before I did all this studying. But 150 milliseconds, we can detect patterns. Auditory system itself analyzes thousands of events per second. That's 15,000 times per second for our outer hair cells, <coughs> not including inner hair cells. And there are about 20,000 per each year. So that's uh, a lot. So some questions to ponder while we go through this. If a tree falls in a forest, do our brains process it? Of course it's going to make sound, but if it enters our ears, it doesn't mean we actually perceive that tree to exist. Other sounds may mask it. We'll cover all sorts of ways that sound might not even hit our mental processes. Sounds that occur, oh, that's what I just said. And tools will come and go, but our brain's perception of sound has been wired over hundreds of millions of years of evolution. We've already seen some VR tools go the way of the dodo, and we've seen new ones pop up all over the place. But these are hard-coded neural processes in our brain and auditory systems. So it's pretty important you understand these things. Which leads us to 5D audio. 5D audio is applying these things to drive player's choice. So, as I said, the player exists in a world of 5D choices. Everything you do in a game is a series of choices. And we can drive that narrative by driving their choices. So the player's brains are also pattern-seeking machines. That might look familiar because you've already seen it and you're looking for patterns. Our subconscious auditory processes are running all the time. You don't control this. Your brain is always spending more energy sending energy to your auditory system than your auditory system is sending to your brain. It's a pretty weird fact, but an interesting one. These are running 100% of the time for the players, whether they know it or not. The players don't know it. You're hacking the player's mind and choices. That's neat. So I wanted to talk about part of what led me to this. Uh, Star VR is twice as immersive as the typical VR headset. Most of them are 100 by 100. This is 210 by 130. It's an interesting concept because as we approach full immersion, when you see players play Star VR headsets, which use like crazy max spec VR computer that has, you know, it's like not consumer at all. They don't do this a lot. 
Whereas when you see Oculus, it, you know, Oculus users just to kind of look around have to do that a lot. These users actually move their eyes because they have twice the width. So they're, they're more fully immersed and it's starting to feel a little more real. And as we approach full immersion, how do we drive player focus? How do we have a narrative in a 360 degree field of infinite options? Well, I'd say sound. And that's what this 5D audio is. It's influencing choice. You can improve mix clarity, improve immersion, organically drive gameplay, and trigger emotions. So I found all these uh, kind of concepts in these books, and this is applying them to improve your audio experience. So first, influencing choice using contrast. Let's get into some applications. The fifth dimension is one of choices. You all know that now. How do we influence those choices? By providing a clear focus using sound. Well, contrast is a great way to do this. Fact is, our brain can only focus on one new thing at a time. People like to think they can multitask, and you can if you've experienced some of that stimulus before, because your brain is not actively processing that stimulus. If you're provided with new stimulus all over the place, your brain is actually using your prefrontal cortex to narrow down what's important out of all that stimulus. That's what these loops are. These loops are just built-in neural processes that will whittle down all the possibilities in a series of networks that say, not important, important, amplify or turn down, and eventually, winner will take all. These are running all the time as well. This is just a real neural concept. I'm not just making these slides up. Could be. These retune your senses from the prefrontal cortex to all your sensory systems. This includes your hearing. Your brain, right now, is retuning all your ears in this room. Your ears are not a microphone. They are being retuned by your brain. It's not a flat one-to-one -one ratio. I'll just let that land. Uh, so yeah, there's one focus point to win them all. How do we get that to the player? How do we tell them this is more important? Well, if it controls our sensory systems and actions, we need to do this well. So to do this, we use contrast, contrast, contrast. This is the number one easiest way to do this. So attention is about picking the important information from the sensory clutter of the world. And in VR, that's a lot. You can see that overwhelmed VR face every time someone puts on a headset for the first time. It's like, oh, and it's always that overwhelmed sensory input. It's not even maybe that they're, they're happy. They're almost just like, you know, going scuba diving the first time. It's all new. So, contrast is just what sticks out, basic concept. What sticks out to you on that page? Probably didn't take long to see it. Contrast. And once you see it, it's almost hard not to look at it. Like, it just kind of draws attention. Now, what about this page? There's something different on there, and it's a little harder to notice. It's not, it's not jumping out of the page. So it's basically the concept of Where's Waldo, but with uh, sound. So as I said, uh, your brain is sending more controlling your auditory system than you are taking in and sending to your brain. So we need to control the contrast. The amount of contrast, based in this study, uh, directly affects the response to the player. The amount of contrast is directly proportional to the amount of attention it will get from the player and focus. So this was a study done where they show a uniform gray field and they play a beep and they have the person raise their hand if they think they see this circle pattern. And it was done over time and if there wasn't enough contrast they would get people kind of like raising their hand if they thought they saw it but the attentional response when it was obvious and the contrast was higher was uh, almost 100%. People are like, yeah, obviously it's super clear. And this is the result of that study. You can see when there's barely any contrast, 0 0.8, there, there's no effect. It's like, uh, I don't know, I, people see it. But when you have high contrast, the response was much, much higher. So the contrast in your mix, the contrast in your frequencies, the contrast in your sound will drive player focus. That's exactly what this study says.
So one way to do that is with silence. Uh, silence, since we are always presented with subconsciously monitored background noise, a sudden lack of silence uh, leaves an awful lot of attentional and arousal control, control bandwidth available. The detection of the absence of sound, while slower than the detection of the sound itself, triggers its own set of responses, increasing attention and arousal. This will retune your ears, making you think something's wrong, I'm ready for something to go wrong. A wonderful example would be the Battlefront series with Ben Minto and the DICE team. You probably are all familiar with the second part of this because it's also from the movies, but really cool moment of silence. Station, we must shut it down. So in that world of clutter, those moments of silence are epic. And I remember the first time I heard that in the theater at Star Wars, and it was like the whole audience was like, <laughs> So that, that still ends, even in gameplay. And you, you've been tuned to expect that to occur, and it doesn't matter, because the battle's so dense that dropping it out and doing that dynamic mix creates that contrast. And Ben's uh, keenly aware of it, and he said that, you know, they were modeling part of that silent drop to get that effect from this particular sound. Water. So to summarize, contrast creates organically driven focus points for the player. The bigger the contrast, the higher the amount of attention an event will get. Pretty simple concept, but it's proven in neural studies. So how else can we drive focus? Well, frequency selection. So it's not just volume and contrast and volume that matters. It's also frequencies we choose to use in our sounds and our mixes. Fact is, our brain adapts to important frequencies and tells our auditory system to give them more attention. Our brains are pattern-seeking machines. That probably sounds more and more familiar every time I say it. For the task engaging the player, the prefrontal cortex associates important information with frequency content then tells the ears to be more sensitive to those frequencies. I go on. So a study was done with a ferret where they played three random noises and then they also played one pure tone. Now this is used in auditory systems regularly because we're tuned in frequency bands in our ears. So by limiting it to one pure band, it's, uh, it's a test that stands over kind of broadband noise. So what they did is they set up this ferret, no ferrets were harmed in this study, but they, they had it drink from a little drop of water, and when they played that tone, they would give it a mild shock through the water if it drank the water. And it would be like a, putting a D battery on your tongue, like unpleasant, not, oh my gosh, just like, you know, this is bad, this is bad. And they would test what would happen to the ferret if they played the tone, and the ferret eventually learned yeah, I'm not going to drink the water while that tone's going off. It would just stop. It's like, yeah, uh, I don't like that, so I stop. They actually now, and this is, this is amazing, they have the technology to measure the neural response to particular frequencies. And you can see whatever band they tune that target tone to, the hearing of the ferret specifically adapts and adds focus to those particular tones. We work the exact same way. If we hear an important sound in a game, we're going to adapt our hearing to that particular tone, and our neural responses are going to associate that with important information. Our brain tunes our ears to say, wait for that sound. And we, we all know this from all sorts of iconic game sounds of danger where you know, ah, you know, watch out, it's coming. But that is a neural study proving all sorts of cool things we do in sound that you might not have known. Another thing that happens with frequencies are habituation. So an overrepresentation of stimulus leads us to ignore it. Habituation, <laughs> habituation is characterized by diminished response to the same stimulus over multiple presentations. Essentially, 
it kicks in faster and lasts longer if the stimulus is repeated more and in shorter intervals. It can be restored if a different frequency is presented occasionally. It's just fatigue of the ears to over-representation of one particular frequency band. <coughs> so what is it? Well, it's the opposite of the ferret study. So the ferret study shows our brains can think that's important, put more attention on it. Habituation says that uh, is now a static tone or not a threat, it's occurring too much, wait for the more dangerous threats. It comes from an evolutionary standpoint of you're in a jungle, you want to hear the tiger over the rustle of the leaves. What's more important, the new stimulus and the frequencies? Probably. Don't get eaten by a tiger. Masking. Uh, louder sounds cover up softer sounds. So this is another frequency kind of idea. Frequency masking, since we're on the topic of frequency, is that masking effect is the highest at the same frequency. Now what I didn't know before I read these books is it also affects surrounding frequencies in varying degrees. So this is a snapshot of how frequency masking actually works. Uh, and if you hadn't done a study in you know, auditory system, you might not be aware of this. So at the same frequency, it's the, the highest amount of masking. Sounds quieter than that tone at the same frequency will be inaudible. Your brain will only pay attention to the loudest one. And it might sound muddy in a mix or bad or you just can't quite hear it because your brain is trying to figure out what's the biggest threat, what's the most important thing. Now as those sounds get louder, they'll mask up to, and this is the crazy thing, a 250 hertz tone can mask up to four kilohertz. I had no idea that the masking went that broadband. So when you're playing sounds in a mix that are very loud and one tonal frequency, look how wide that'll mask other sounds in your mix. So you might be doing sidechain ducking, but you're probably not accounting for this width of masking and frequencies. So be aware that louder sounds will mask not just one frequency, it'll mask surrounding frequencies in varying degrees. Temporal masking is a very odd phenomenon based in time, but since we're talking about 4D and 5D, we might as well go there. So it's a 4D time phenomenon, which masking can be exploited before and after a signal. That's not a typo. Our brain can mask sounds before we perceive them to exist. Technically, we're all time traveling in this room 80 milliseconds. That's how long it takes our brain to be aware of what's going on in the world. So in that amount of time, there are certain processes where we can mask sounds before we even know they're there in the time domain. There are 20 milliseconds of pre-masking before the signal occurs. A uh, crazy concept. And up to 200 milliseconds after the signal finishes. So this isn't really frequency, but since I was talking about masking, I wanted to go there. The highest amount is five milliseconds before a sound occurs. So if a loud sound occurs, by the time we process it, our brains may mask sounds before we perceive it, and up to 200 milliseconds after, turning down other sounds in your mix. A great case for HDR, ducking, and all sorts of concepts, but we'll get into how to apply it later. I just thought that was pretty cool. So the summary of frequency would be, Frequencies create organically driven focus points for the player. The brain tunes the ears to important frequencies, decreases sensitivity to overuse frequencies, and basically dynamically tunes our auditory system for specific frequencies, surrounding frequencies, and over time. Did I mention this is dense? Uh, frequency contrast and a frequency selection and contrast. So let's, let's get into how to use those to improve your mixes and actually apply these concepts. Theory is nice, but application is better. So you can use dynamic range to leave headroom for important sounds. HDMI cable. Dynamic range to leave headroom for important sounds. 
side chain ducking for smooth dynamic mixing and not just volume based but frequency based and very selectively based not to ruin immersion employ silence and dynamic contrast for key moments as in the battle for an example employ frequency contrast to draw attention to key moments and dialogue remember one thing rules them all draw focus and stagger important stimulus to prevent masking and confusion I mean when possible narratively stagger your sounds so it's not all in one place but you know we work in games and they're dynamic so these things will help save your mixes luffs is not enough this doesn't really help too much you know I mean it's a standard for TV film media and it it helps us getting the same basic uniform level especially if something consumed one after another after another but it's just perceived volume over time it doesn't say your mix is good it doesn't give you real contrast it doesn't help with frequency fatigue focus or employ effective use of silence it's just a starting point and uh, you know a good starting point but how do we take that to a 5d audio meter well one thing I really like to do is Reaper Spectral Peaks, and you might have thought FFT, but I like the Spectral Peaks particularly for this exact reason. Spectral, spectral Peaks will show the dominant frequencies over time, so it's not just too much information, it shows you which frequency is standing out at any given moment. So you can visualize this frequency for all the things we just learned that we do all the time, including habituation and frequency masking, Ensuring your dialogue frequencies are clear in your mix and not cluttered with sound design and other things going on in music. And ensure asset contrast so the key parts of your mix stand alone in that frequency spectrum instead of being habituated and turned down because your brain is fatigued. So here's one example. This is the Mummy Prodigium Strike VR. And you can see there are a couple key moments where Penka, the composer, uh, added some low end in between kind of battles. Uh, this is a really good study in it because it was an on the rails experience. It's a VR, you can look anywhere, but the helicopter ride went one way and it always landed at the same amount of time and you always played the last battle the same amount of time unless you were terrible and died early, which people did. But this was a very crafted mix. So it's a good place to show this. You can see some of those, uh, those green frequencies where dialogue's poking through. And you can ensure nothing else is really getting in, in the way of it. And you can tune these frequencies to your key iconic sounds, your dialogue frequencies, your low end to ensure your music's not fatiguing the listener and the 80 or the low band. Uh, really, really handy stuff. And Reaper is just amazing, so go get Reaper anyway. Uh, here's another example. This was a Star VR Salt Conference demo uh, where a bunch of people went in and had the Starbreeze uh, headset on and experienced this mix. And you can see uh, this was uh, composer Jesse Harlan, and I did the sound design in the final mix. And you can see it's funny, it did a similar thing. Most of these peaks are the music, but you can see some of the, uh, the breaks in there organically. You know, I didn't tell Jesse about 5D audio. I didn't even have these concepts when we did this. But in retrospect, we do a lot of these things organically as we work. We know about fatigue and we know when something works or not. This just makes it concrete and shows you kind of a yeah, quality assurance style that you're not fatigued or tired and you can really just look at it. It's another way to help you ensure your mix is good. So the classic ducking techniques that are so terrible, uh, the event-based sounds on or events playing, whether signal occurs or not, duck it. Uh, uh, it's terrible, specifically for VR, absolutely terrible. I've played a few games, won't call them out, but where the ducking occurred and the ducking was applied to the ambient bus. And the moment you duck the entire sound of the world you're in, was the moment you grab the chair and nearly vomit. Uh, it's amazing that that occurred. I'm sure they weren't using wise or some, you know, uh, just don't do it. But it's heavy handed and includes silent moments. Huge loss of immersion. I mean, I, I could equate what happened to me in these games when it occurred because I'm a sound guy and of course I noticed that the 
ambience dropped off and all of a sudden I'm losing where I am in the world. But for the average consumer, they'll just say, I'm sick, this game makes me sick, it sucks. So don't do that. Uh, modern ducking techniques, much better. Sidechain volume ducking is good. Selectively is even better. Don't just apply it to the sound effects bus. I mean, most of us are doing this. Apply selectively to things that don't ruin immersion, but just give clarity to the important narrative focus of the game. So Wise, fantastic, gives us Wise Meter, which allows us to do side chaining very easily in the box without any coding or scripting support. Thanks, Audio Kinetic. Uh, but that's not even as far as it should go. Uh, in my opinion, sidechain selectively using volume and EQ is excellent. And why? It's all the concepts we just discussed. We get fatigue in specific bands, we have masking in specific bands, so why not work with specific bands? So yeah, never duck the ambience. I had to write that again because, you know, I got sick. And here's a demonstration in a DAW for anyone that doesn't actually do side chaining. Uh, basic concept is just this signal occurs while this signal occurs do something else as it receives signal. So in this case, while the dialogue talks, I'm sending to this pro MB and I'm doing dynamic ducking of the music in selected bands. These are the three bands I'm ducking whenever the dialogue occurs. So watch, as this dialogue plays, this will duck these bands of the music. Not the sound effects, just a demonstration. And see details once hidden by screens. Examine problems from new heights and glean solutions from a new perspective. Allowing us to be in the sky, the building, or even in the data and see it for what it really represents. critical for this because this whole experience was designed basically to show how Star VR can work in multiple industries and the only thing that mattered to these people was the dialogue, like informing them what matters. The, sure, the sound design is cool or whatever and it might impress, but it's all about intelligibility of dialogue. And they can look anywhere while that's happening, but with the sounds, they often just left their focus on the things that occurred in the room due to these concepts. So you're thinking, yeah, Aaron, I'm a game audio professional at a game conference. I know how to <laughs> sidechain a compressor in a DAW. But, wise example, uh, I'll show you how to do the traditional kind of the bad ducking, and then good sidechain ducking using a three-band EQ within WISE itself, using the same example from the DAW, but applied in WISE. Welcome to a new way to see, to an age of remarkable vision, a vision we can use to discover and delight, a vision we can use to improve our lives. Welcome to a new way to see, to an age of remarkable vision, a vision we can use to discover and delight, a vision we can use to improve our lives. Super smooth, can't even freaking tell it's occurring. And when you set this stuff up right, sometimes you have to like look at it and go, are we ducking? You know, it's like, it's just clear, clean, and now there's no frequency masking. Uh, and I have that session, I'll put it up on, on the Y site to just show people really basic. I can't share the audio in it, but I'll just share it like as a template, be like, all right, go sidechain duck with three band EQs and have fun. So interestingly enough, after I put this talk together, I uh, went to Microsoft and Elise Baldwin was using this technique uh, independently of this and brought in Lucky's voice, so I'm working on Super Lucky's Tale, and we were doing a mix, and she brought it into an Adobe Audition and did an FFT analysis to find the two resonant peaks. So is what 
tonal frequencies stand out. And it's pretty obvious. Pull in about five files and go, well, it's this one and this one. So now you know which bands need to be audible and which bands stand out for Lucky's voice. So then when Lucky talks, you take Wise Meter and you duck other things in those bands to ensure that those resonant peaks stand out, but not ruining immersion, not ducking things that don't need to be ducked. We no longer need to do that. We have the power of side, band, side chain multi-band ducking in Wise. It's freaking fantastic. <laughs> That was the sound. So improve your mixes by doing all these things I just discussed. I don't think you really need me to ruin them. By the way, I uh, put this up on the website so you can go download this. I don't think there's going to be time for questions, but uh, hit me up. We'll chat later. So improve your mixes. The focus parameter. This is a way to take it uh, to another level in VR, and I think it works specifically well in VR. So anyone who's done an Unreal game with the stock Unreal tech, uh, which is what the uh, Mummy Prodigium Strike was, there's a focus parameter that basically tunes sound, allow you to tune sounds based on if it's in your vision or not. And you can define how in your vision, whether it's like straight center or you know, kind of like right here, center vision as they turn. So it tunes sounds based on visual importance. And often, we kind of do this in the real world when we're looking and we see important things or we hear it. You know, like you're in a, in a restaurant and something crashes and most people look over. It's startling, it gets your attention and you also hear it. Uh, the visual, like I said, so you can heighten senses based on the player focus in the VR space. And I found it particularly useful to clear the sonic stuff when out of focus. I mean, this got crazy. There were about 40 undead on the screen at one time. Which undead is important? Which of the 20 spiders that'll jump and kill you were important? <clears throat> this helped clear up that clutter and let the player make a choice on focus. So Unreal has it built in tech, but WISE can actually do this as well with an RTPC on azimuth and elevation. I don't have an example of it, but it, it can only be applied to the game object level. You can't do it on a bus. But this is theoretically all possible in WISE as well, but the Unreal Focus parameter is just in the attenuation, and you just kind of tweak a couple of numbers. So I wanted to show it. Uh, this is an extremely low-res version of the play-in editor of the VR. Uh, you know, I don't have the write and chip. But it's just a demonstration of extreme settings. You would never, I, I don't think you would, use 2.0 and 0.5. This is just to show you that all the sounds you're going to hear from the enemies in this video are in focus. There are enemies off screen, to your right, behind you. You're not going to hear any of them. It almost feels like a movie mix because it's just what's in front of you. Probably not desirable entirely, but a good demonstration. like you guys found some friends. Gunner, protect the ground team while they get into position. The team has established the perimeter. Gunner, watch their backs and take out anything that gets through. Super extreme, and you know, you look like this far over and they're gone. But lightly applied, this really clears up a mix and gives a focus to it. So it's best applied kind of after you have a good mix that gels, you've done your side chain, you have a good mix, but it's just not given the proper narrative focus or is too cluttered. Good way to apply it. So these are the actual settings I used, uh, and this will be included on the downloadable stuff for anybody that just wants to see it. It's very subtle. I believe it's like 1.2, 0 0.8, you know, very, very light. And most of what I did that sounded the best to me was volume attenuation based on focus. There are other things you can do with that parameter, but overall it just felt that when not in focus, make 0.8 of the original volume, and when in focus, up the volume 1.2. It's a multi multiplier of your average volume. So the summary of improving your mixes is 
Dynamic range is a good start, but do a 5D audio check. Pull it in Reaper, look at your clear frequency peaks. Stagger sensory information where possible. Don't just rely on ducking. Work with your team wherever possible to ensure that dialogue doesn't occur while the helicopter's going down, while things are exploding. No personal story there whatsoever. Use focus parameter to dynamically alter player perception and mix. Again, best played at the end, just as a little focus. Uh, selectively sidechain parameter ducking is better than traditional ducking. And check your mix using spectral peak analysis. So how do you approve immersion? Well, in a world where something's 230 degrees as big as the Star VR headset or even Oculus headsets, immersion and accuracy is more important than ever. So there are these two things called MMN and SSA. It's kind of the brain's built-in QA team saying, is this right? And adjusting frequencies. MMN is mismatched negativity. It's evoked by unexpected sounds embedded in a stream of expected sounds. It's unconsciously evoked through poor variation settings on footsteps, in sounds, uh, incorrect physics sounds, silent interactions with things, and breaking expected patterns. It's mostly breaking expected patterns. And it, well, interestingly enough, you know, this is in a book just about the auditory system, and I'm reading it like, yeah, that's what we do in games, like, all the time. So when patterns are unintentionally broken, the immersion is broken. So setting those patterns matters a lot. The SSA I mentioned is stimulus-specific adaptation, where the midbrain and cortex habituation that causes common tones to be habituated and variations to cause more attention. That's kind of the habituation I mentioned earlier, where neurons tire of overly repetitive tones, but once something new comes along, ears perk up, give it attention. So why does that matter to immersion? When rare stimulus is unintentional, it'll cause improper player focus. If you've made ambience that's this flat bed and it's fairly distant, and then there's that one dog bark that's like mid and close with a resonant peak, the player's gonna always look for that one particular sound. It stands out of the mix. So beware that if you're trying to draw a clear focus here, don't play new stimulus over here. So most importantly, based on these studies in MMN, uh, to maintain immersion in VR, the sound must be accurate and consistent, because those inconsistencies would break immersion based on these neural studies. MMN can break it in as little as 150 milliseconds. That's all it takes. SSA can break it in 30 milliseconds. That's how fast these things are working constantly and in these studies, people would just know something's wrong. They couldn't quantify it. They would, uh, one particular study that really stood out was they would play 10 footsteps. And they would play one on wood and one on another tone like that. And it would be wood, that, wood, 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 that. And that's the one they thought was wrong. Because this set a pattern where they thought, maybe it is this and then this. But once it did this many in a row and it built a pattern, breaking that expectation is what made MMN trigger in the people. So in variations, it's more about setting the expected patterns than anything else. So where does this matter? Uh, particularly physics, I mean footsteps and, and all these things. If the player can mess with objects, they will. Uh, you, you've seen people play Job Simulator. It's a mess. Uh, unrealistic to expect perfect realistic physics on every object in the game. I, I don't know that anyone here has worked on a game willing to spend the budget, time, manpower to get perfect physics in every game. Certain people have tried. Uh, I don't even think it's worth it on most titles. Obviously it's expensive. Uh, but if you set the rules consistently, you're going to be alright. Because that's what MMN is. It's establishing a pattern and sticking to it. Breaking it is what ruins immersion. So I learned this on Robo Recall. Uh, well, I didn't. It made sense after I read it, and then I went back to Robo Recall. Everything interactable in this game has that white reticule around it. You can't grab anything that doesn't have that. 
And you can watch people play. And the first time they play, they try to grab every damn thing in the room. But eventually they learn or they just stop. They stop trying. And they're not upset about it. They're just like, okay, I'll just grab things that are white. They learn the rules and then they're fine. Uh, so the same thing with the sounds. Uh, these sounds were a very basic set of physics sounds, but everything that was interactable had the same set of physics sounds, establishing a pattern, making it consistent, feeling immersive. I just love that we have players grabbing the bobbleheads and shaking them and listening and watching them. Like, that's, that's the game space we're in right now. <laughs> so establishing consistent patterns is what mattered there. And this is the first room in the game. Like, you start the game and you're, you're in an elevator and then you're in this room. The players already learned at this point in about three minutes, two minutes, that these are the rules and is sticking to them. So this is the physics system. You can see it a lot better in the downloadable slide, but more importantly, Robo Recall is free to download. So if anybody's working in the stock Unreal Engine, you can go download it, check it out, and just pull it apart. See the work Tom Bible and the team there did and some of the physics sounds that I set up. But it was just a series of light and heavy variations, pitch and volume curves, grab and drop sounds. No slide, no ridiculous architecture, Pretty standard physics stuff, but everybody was happy because it was consistent. So the summary is, maintaining immersive sound environment is critical. Static ambient beds should be predictable. Don't put sounds in your static ambient beds that are off the wall because they'll draw attention unintentionally. Avoid MNN by being consistent with the rules of your game's audio. Don't break patterns you establish. Be clear in the rules of your world. As little as a 10% increase in volume will draw attention to a sound. That's kind of where we start perceiving the change in an overall mix based on these neural studies. I thought it would have been less, and to a trained ear it actually was less. Uh, this is like average human neural studies. <laughs> Interestingly enough, for the pros in the room, it's measurably different because we're trained to hear less but uh, if I go on that tangent, we'll never get out of here. Unexpected stimuli cause decrease in cognitive performance. So with Walla, there were studies done where if it's slightly intelligible, but not entirely intelligible, it would make you feel like you can't make sense of it and draw more attention and make players feel uneasy. Whereas if it was completely unintelligible, it's okay. Or if it's, un if it's intelligible, it's also slightly okay. It was that mix where the player's trying to make sense of it and can't that makes the player try to make sense of the world. So be aware that will also draw attention. So we can use sound to also organically drive gameplay. Patterns and repetition train players organically. Our brains are pattern-seeking machines. That should look really familiar. This can be used to our advantage. Use patterns to draw attention to sounds in 150 milliseconds, MMN. And the best part is you can use the patterns to give information without annoying HUD and pop-up messages and all the plague of those things we see today. We can communicate using sound. And here's an excellent example, Martin Stig Anderson, Inside, where he used two segments of the game telling the player what to do strictly with visuals and sound. Uh, beautifully, beautifully done, wonderful experience. Highly recommend playing it. Let's take a listen.
player learns when it's safe to run and when it's not. There's no HUD, there's no countdown, there's no annoying dialogue like, RUN! You know, <laughs> doesn't need it. It's organically telling the story with sound. I'd love to do more of that. We can also train the player using Hebe and plasticity, which is just neural learning. Uh, the concept is neurons that fire together, wire together. And that's like tying those visuals and the sounds together. Our brain is just constantly making sense of the world, so it's putting that information together and saying, this is important, this occurs a lot together, link them, put them together in your brain. It's not a coincidence that was named after Donald Hebb. The key points here are, sound can drive gameplay organically without the need for a HUD UI or unnecessary dialogue. Use patterns and repetitive frequencies to train players, be cautious of habituation, and use MMN to your advantage by establishing a pattern for particular sounds and the rules of the sound of your game. And triggering emotions. So sometimes in the quest for perfect sound I spend too much time on the sound design or perfecting the music and I simply forget the importance that the voice is the most powerful emotional trigger of all. These books drove it home repeatedly. In all cognitive tests, in all neural studies, voice was the most powerful emotional trigger of all. So we, we think, I don't know, I, as a sound designer sometimes I just, I get so into crafting that perfect sound and I, I get, I just sidetrack that a little bit, but it's very important to constantly remind yourself of that. Uh, you can get a strong positive emotional response to sounds in less than a second. That's how fast it takes your brain to, to latch on to something and know if you should feel an emotion. Emotional assets also draw focus. So one, one example is this even works on robots. Uh, this was an early prototype of Robo Recall where I'm just in my room pulling apart robots and just te testing sound design. So this is no music, a little test level robot destruction. So that's, that makes them land. They feel like real things all of a sudden. It was mostly the voice. You know, all those sounds, all those cool sounds in the world could just kind of give you information. The moment they have those service, it's like it's got character. It's a thing. So don't forget. I know we all know that, but just don't forget. Fear. Uh, I had to work on fear pretty hard in the Mummy Prodigium Strike because it's all about fear. It was about those reactions that you saw at the beginning. So we're most sensitive in the 1 to 4K range. I think it was particularly the 2 and 3 bands. And it's partially because of the size of our ear canal and partially because of human speaking frequencies and us being tuned to those particular <clears throat> consonant frequencies. But that means we're more sensitive to those frequencies. So don't overuse them or when you have dialogue and important sounds in those range they won't land you'll be fatigued from constantly very sensitive sounds try to use them mostly for dialogue uh, close sounds also have more transient attack which stand out and startle the player and I learned that through doing these studies and I'll show you a little example of it we had a particular attenuation on some actors that got real close to the player and they were unique. Like I said, we had an on-the-rails experience. So we had just a few actors that were totally separate, that would run up, that we could make a unique attenuation, unique sounds. And those had a little more transient response. They sounded closer, and they sounded like they were nearly in your ear. And that's when those people jumped. That was the biggest jump moment of all those. The other ones kept them distant, kept them 
you know, a little nerve-wracking, but not. Ah! You can't constantly startle them, or you'll habituate them. And you'll, you'll read about people complaining that all over the place with too many jump scares, too many this and that. Don't habituate the player. Focus parameter can accentuate this effect. And, like I said, create contrast between the passive danger and the close active danger. You need that to land. Can't all be scary all the time. Here's another example of it working. So I edited that down to the scary moments, but there are, there are lulls between those. They wouldn't be reacting like that if it was constantly, you know, actor right in their ear. It's really important that you be aware of the lull of these concepts we've discussed. So the key points are emotions change the player focus and perception, vary the stimulus to prevent habituation and maximize response, use voice to maximize emotional response, don't forget voice and leave headroom for high contrast scare moments. And with that, we've made it to the end. So that's the summary of concepts. A lot of information, but I figured you'd want you know, that at this talk. So we exist in a slice of 3D space, 4D time, and 5D choice. Seems a long time ago we talked about that. Our brains are pattern-seeking machines. It looks really familiar. 5D choice relies on focus. We drive that focus using contrast, frequency, memory, and patterns. The player perception changes over time based on what's important, based on masking, time masking. And it can tune in or tune out sounds over time, adjusting our hearing as we listen. It's always subconsciously running, and the players can be trained through sound. So how do we use them? We drive player focus and choice. You can improve your mixes and immersion. You can use side chain ducking to multi-band EQs. You can use focus parameters to tune the mix dynamically and draw focus. Check your mixes in Reaper to ensure clean spectral peaks and no habituation. Be consistent with your game sound rules so you prevent MMN from ruining the immersion of your experience. Stagger sensory input to prevent too much input to the player. Use patterns and repetition to drive player decisions organically, and use human voice and varied stimulus to trigger emotions. And with that, go forth and hack your player's brain using sound. Questions? Anybody? So many, so many. Uh, I'm sure there will be questions. Please hit me up on Twitter, hit up AGC Connect, uh, contact me directly on the website. Alexander. I'm going to break the silence and Thank establish you. hopefully a pattern. Look at that. <laughs> See how, how effective that was. <laughs> now, this is really, really interesting stuff. Um, Thank you. How, how much of this, I mean, it looks as though you've really been, you've gone deep with research. And my, I guess my question is some of these phenomena. Like, how much of these do you, are you like, okay, that's definitely something that I not only researched, but I saw completely proven out in my game dev and in the player experience? Um, almost all of these, but not, I wasn't, so I only started to be aware of them in the last three months. I started to make this talk and really dive into these books. And these are the references for anybody that really wants to dive into the neural lessons and summaries. Uh, what was most interesting to me was every time I would read something that would pop out as part of our common creative processes, I would you know, just highlight it like, oh, well, we kind of do that, or that seems important, and then tie it all together. And the more I read it over, I was like, oh, shit, we, are, we already do that. You know, A lot of this is part of our taste. We just define it as taste. We're like, yeah, that sounds good. That's ducking is better, but we might not have contributed it to MMN or you know, real patterns or these particular masking effects that spread. It just, you know, like, it sounds better. But now we know why. Thank you. Yeah? There's a, another one I remember from classes a long time ago, uh, which is that they did studies to show that people in the back of the classroom, which I am now, thankfully, via amplification, but um, 
in the cases of non-amplified situations, their brain was spending more time decoding the signal that is now embedded in the dreamer. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Which so, led to them processing the actual information that they were being given less, because a lot of their brain was being focused on decoding the information that they were receiving. I can see that, yeah. And there's, um, and so oh. there was basically the idea that the smart kids sit in the front of the room. It's not actually the smart kids necessarily so much as the people who sit in the front of the room are actually having to spend less brain effort the attentive, yeah, yeah just actually, easily aware. That makes uh, a lot I'm of sense. I'm just curious how that might apply, that concept might apply to VR and... Well, the focus parameter can actually do that. It can push things back in the mix or push them forward. So it's not just a volume-based thing. You can use that to do multiple things in the mix, and one of the unreal parameters is distance. You can change a multiplier on how far it seems from you. Mm -hmm. So you can just certainly you apply it. You could just say, yeah, it's, uh, it's off-camera, make it feel more distant. So but does that change the, the volume as well as the reverb in that case? I believe it does. I think it's a multiplier that just takes whatever attenuation you have and applies that to your attenuation and says, yeah, turn it down and apply whatever attenuation parameter applies to that multiplier. Cool. I didn't use it that much, though. It felt fake, you know? Like, it just it kept taking me out. Maybe I didn't dial it in enough. That's why I just showed the other one. But, uh, yeah, that is interesting. Other questions, I think? No, oh, we got a little, we're a little over, but I don't care. <laughs> yes? So, what do you think about the, the concepts of, you know, audio always reactive to things that happen? What do these techniques do? Bring focus and, and merge into the, to the player. I mean, I love it. I think we all probably love it in the room. Uh, getting devs to do that and have the time is the other thing. Like um, the inside example, everything Martin wanted, Martin got. And that's, I mean, I'm so jealous, ridiculously jealous. But it, what you're saying is exactly the approach that should be taken in VR. I mean, with that many processes going on automatically that they're not all aware of, it seems absurd not to put that forward in the discussions of, yeah, we want more immersion. Focus on sound too. You know, it should be right in the beginning. How do we build that? Okay. Well, anybody with other questions, uh, contact me. I'll answer anything. And uh, thank you for coming to my talk.